Yes, we got to pause so. everything for a minute because we have joining us from the athletic. Whoop, I had you on there. <laughs> joining us from the athletic, we have Arthur Staple. Arthur, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we'll thank you. Our names on there. Okay. Thanks for coming on with us, Art. So, you know, uh, finally, Lou showed his cards a little bit with these signings. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you think about it? Uh, where? Uh, where do they go from here now that these guys are under contract officially? Well, I mean, I think they've been operating with these guys under contract for almost a month, which, uh, you know, I, the fact that you didn't hear anybody's name out there on the rumor mill or anything like that kind of confirms it. And there's still a few other guys, too, that, that, that they'll be bringing in. I don't think it's anybody that's on a multi-year deal necessarily, but uh, you can kind of assume that. Zach Parise is an Islander. Travis Zajac is an Islander. Uh, I think Michael Del Call will still be an Islander. Um, Anatoly Goloshev. So maybe some lesser guys. But I think, uh, you know, Lou letting these contracts out now either was something that he decided to do a while ago. And this September 1st was just for him the start of the new league year, like it was like August 1st was for everybody else. Um, or... You know, he's got a trade that uh, that he's ready to, to pull the trigger on. And these deals don't really, you know, he can reveal his cap numbers now that he didn't want to reveal to his trade partner. So uh, Lou works in mysterious ways, and we all just kind of wait to see what happens. <laughs> Arthur, aside from uh, Tarasenko, are there any other possible trades that the Islanders were working on by any chance? You know, I, I think they're still interested in Tarasenko, but I, it, it sort of seems like a secondary issue to me. But the, the primary one being they need to replace Nick Letty. Um, you know, they traded him very early on in the offseason. Uh, it seemed like an obvious move at the time because they needed to free up some cap space to make all these other deals. But it was also kind of predicated on the idea that they needed to find another second pair left defenseman and a guy who uh, in Letty has been a real, you know, he's had some ups and downs in terms of the results, but... He is a, a reliable guy. Uh, he, you know, he plays hurt. Uh, his speed is something that's not really matched by a lot of defensemen in the league, even at age 30. Uh, plays on the power play. So there are some, you know, there are some, some requirements that they needed to fill, and I'm sure that they were working on it. You know, I, I'd heard that they were talking to Seattle. It might have been about Vince Dunn, uh, who kind of really? fills a similar, similar sort of profile, but Seattle ended up signing him. So I think he's staying out there. Uh, they do have a couple of extra defensemen. There's some other guys that you can kind of just logically put two and two together. You know, a guy like Hampus Lindholm, who's got a year left on his deal out in Anaheim, and they seem to be in full, you know, rebuild mode going going young. Um, so, you know, th there are some guys, you know, I think Zidane Ochara's name has been thrown around. Out of the, I don't really see him being a second pair guy anymore at his age. Um but I think that's really the priority, and maybe we'll find out. Maybe while we're talking right now, Lou will drop another <laughs> another nugget <laughs> on all of us and, uh, and and put out word about a trade. But um, you know, they don't really have a lot of cap space right now. They're at with these signings today. They're at about a little over eighty five million, uh, and if you factor in Johnny Boychuk's six million against LTIR, that's eighty seven million that they got to work with. So not a lot of room unless they can shed another contract. A guy like Leo Komarov or Thomas Hickey. Um, they do have a couple of young left defensemen. Robin Salo is coming over from Europe after having a good year in Sweden. And Samuel Bolduc, who was a 2019 draft pick, had a really good year in the abbreviated AHL season. But uh, I think we know Lou Lamarillo and we know Barry Trotz well enough to know he's not trusting 19 or 20 minutes a night to a kid who's just coming over from Europe who, no. or a 21-year-old who's got 28 pro games under his belt. So there is something else coming, I feel. We just don't know what it is yet. <laughs> Wow. Arthur, would that something else be possibly uh, Vladimir Tarasenko? I mean, that could be the the one B maneuver. Um, you know, right now you kind of look at their group of forwards, and obviously it's a crowded group when you talk about that eighty five point two million. That includes Richard Ponick, who they got back. You know, it's just kind of a body back in the Letty deal from Detroit. I, I mentioned Michael Del Call; he'll be back. Anatoly Goloshev will get a fir first full year uh, over here in North America. Uh, Leo Komarov still on the books. So they've got a pretty crowded group. It's probably like 15 or 16 guys. So not all those guys are going to make it. But even if you subtract a few of the obvious ones and bury those cap hits in the minors, where is Tarasenko going to play with this group right now? If you've got Zach Parisi already here, you've got Kyle Palmieri here, you've got Oliver Wallstrom who needs time. Um, you know, Tarasenko, if he's healthy, is obviously a huge talent. 
but uh, to make the money work and more importantly, to make the roster work, you'd have to think that they're, they'd have to shed somebody. You know, Josh Bailey was left unprotected in the Seattle expansion draft. They went for Jordan Everly instead. And Bailey's, you know, one of the three or four longest tenured Islanders in team history. So is it, is it him that would be moving out to make room for Tarasenko? Is that the sort of upgrade that the Islanders want? They want that much more scoring that they're willing to sacrifice, uh, you know, a guy who's sort of a, you know, does a little bit of everything well in Bailey. Not for me to say, um, you know, I, I imagine that Lou keeps all his options open till the very last minute and the last minute has nowhere near come yet. We're still three weeks away from training camp. So we'll see where that, where that leads. Now, Arthur, I'm glad you brought up Josh Bailey because, um, you know, he's been a pretty polarizing figure since he's been drafted. As you know, a lot of Islander fans has always, has always, you know, rode him hard and been a little too hard on him. Um, and even as he, over the years, as he matured and become a really productive player, there are Islander fans that still kind of use him as like a scapegoat and whatnot. But you mentioned Hampus Lindholm. Lindholm has a similar salary to Bailey. I believe he makes over $5 million. So if that's the way that they wanted to go, try to acquire him, could you see Bailey go for a guy like Hampus Lindholm, being that the salaries are almost like a wash? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a Lindholm situation for Anaheim, they're going to want futures. You know, like I said, they're they're kind of going as young as they can go. Um, you know, if they're going to give up a guy who's been a mainstay for them for such a long time, I imagine they would want some more assets. You know, draft picks, prospects, younger players, things like that. Um, I think Bailey really only leaves if they're going to bring in another forward. I, you know, they they still have a pretty full group even without Bailey. If you slot in Wallstrom and, like I said, Palmieri's still here, and maybe Ponick or one of those other guys can or Dal Cole can fill more of a third line role. But um, you know, it, it, I I don't think Lou. I think judging by the fact that they lost Eberle in the expansion draft, they lost Letty. He doesn't seem to like to let a lot of guys go that he doesn't have to let go. And I don't I don't know that they're unless they've completely soured on Josh Bailey, which doesn't seem likely. Uh, I don't know that they're wanting to let him go in any kind of move uh, unless it's like, unless it's a big upgrade. And I think, you know, like we talked about, they do need a, a middle pair defenseman, but uh, I would imagine that's more of a, a futures move. And then you try to figure out how the money works after that. Okay. Arthur, do you get the sense that Lou is comfortable with this roster as is? Yeah, I do. You know, um, I, I think uh, I think they do need a defenseman. I'll, I'll keep saying that because just the way that the, the team is built, you know, they're not they're not built to to kind of wing it that way uh, at such an important position. But uh, but I think up front, yeah, you know, uh, I think bringing in Parise uh, obviously was kind of a you know they tried to get him at the deadline a couple of years ago and it didn't work out um, given his you know, contract was so complicated. Uh, and now with him bought out. You know, obviously Lou likes his guys. You know, Kyle Palmieri, people assume that he's a Lou guy because he was a devil, but I think he came in soon just after Lou had, st had stepped aside and Ray Shearer took yeah. over. But I think even at that, Lou certainly can see a player like that uh, often enough to know he's one of their guys, and that was a priority for them. Travis Ajak, Andy Green, Parise now, you know, like he has his guys. So I think he feels comfortable with the support group of the, of the Islanders core that he inherited being – his guys. And, uh, and yeah, I, you know, I, I think we always kind of have looked at this roster the last couple of years and said, they need this or they need that. And they've shown uh, that, that they've been close enough to, to kind of refute that theory that uh, they are good enough. So I think the way that they are right now, yeah, I think they're good enough to compete. I don't know if they're a division champ, the way that they're kind of being portrayed right now, because I think people have finally started to realize how good this team is, but uh, they are they are going to be one of the tougher outs in the playoffs if they make it, as usual. And I think uh, this group, as constituted, can do that. I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to try to think of another question at the moment because it's so hard to get information out of Lou. Like, he should be the head of the CIA with the amount of uh, <laughs> uh, leaks that he, he doesn't let out. Um, but what are, what are some veteran possibilities to replace Nick Letty if uh, none of the young kids work out? You know, there's certainly not a lot of people available uh, at this point. You kind of had had a few names when free agency started, and they all started to kind of slowly tick off. We wondered a little bit as free agency went, you know, is Ryan Murray an option? And then kind of quietly he went to Colorado. Um, you know, you just sort of by process of elimination see who might be out there. That's how you land on a guy like Lindholm. That's, you know, I thought Mark Stahl would have been an interesting option for them, maybe more as a third-pair guy. Uh 
me personally, I think I like him a little bit better than I like Andy Green at this stage of their careers. But again, that's a Lou guy. So Andy Green was locked up almost immediately to another deal. And you sort of assume, given their depth on the left side, that, that he's got a spot on that third pair once again uh, with Noah Dobson. So, you know, it, without having the list in front of me to see, uh, you know, who might be an option, you know, I thought Alex Goligoski, there was some interest there too early on in free agency. So I think Lou kind of went through his processes of can we get somebody to be a bit of a stopgap, another one year guy on, for not such a, you know, not much, uh, much of a cap hit. Um, and then struck out there because he didn't find the guy that he wanted. So now you look at a trade and, you know, if, if it's still talking to Seattle, can they get Vince Dunn? Is Vince Dunn more in Seattle's plans? Is a guy like Carson Soucy, who they also picked up in the, in the expansion draft from, from Minnesota. Is he a guy who fits what they want to do? Um, you know, there's, it, it's hard to say to me, it just doesn't seem possible that, uh, that they're going to go to camp with what they've got right now. And even if Zdeno Char decides he wants to play, and decides he wants to finish his career where it started two decades ago on the island. I still don't see him as as a guy that they can rely on to to fill that that Nick Letty spot. So um, you know, uh, you kind of go on cap friendly and run down the list and, and <laughs> make notes and wonder if the guy's available. Um, it's a little easier to get information out of some people on other teams than it is out of the team that I cover. So sometimes it's easy to turn it <laughs> off, but. Yeah, but you do a hell of a job doing that, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you it's just you, uh, you crack me up when you talk about your offer with uh, requesting players and Lou denying them <laughs> all the time. It's yeah, it's it's been uh, you know the the pandemic has obviously changed the way that it, you cover teams because most everything is on the computer. But um, but even with Lou, I think it's uh, you know someone who likes to be in control of a lot of different situations. It's him extending this this off season of uncertainty until today with some of the contracts and maybe even beyond uh, with in terms of access, you know, it's it's hard to get a handle on talking to people because they don't want anyone to talk about situations that haven't been resolved yet, like a possible trade. So yeah, we wait, we wait to see if uh, I'll keep asking if I can talk to Barry at some point this summer and uh, it'll turn into <laughs> talking to him on the first day of training camp. Before yeah. You know yeah. It. <laughs> Now, Arthur, we know what they're going to look like in goal. No secret, Verlamov and Sorokin. Um, you know, obviously, Ilya finally came, and I think uh, a lot of Islander fans, you know, really loved them right off the bat, even though he had that miserable first game against the Rangers, which was a little unfair to him due to the circumstances, how he came in. But he played really well in the Pittsburgh series, and he won it. So going into this season, do you think at any point he could take significant playing time away from Verlamov, or do you think Verlamov's going to be the guy again for the majority of the year? You know, I think it starts off with Varlamov maybe getting two out of every three and then Sorokin comes in. But I, I imagine, you know, the first 82 game season in two years, a goalie in Varlamov, who's not a young guy anymore, necessarily he's got a lot of tread on the tires. There is a goalie in the NHL. You're going to need both. And, you know, they coaches say that all the time now in the last few years that you're going to need both guys. Uh, and I think it's going to be more true than ever this year because, um, especially when you look at the Islanders schedule, but if they do, you know, if the NHL does go to the Olympics, it's going to stay condensed all those games on the road. Uh, I think they have the second or third most back-to-backs in the league. You're going to see plenty of Ilya Sorokin. And I don't think it's going to be a, a, an issue about who's, who's one a and who's one B um, that'll be more, you know, they'll sort themselves out as the season goes on and, and gets towards the playoffs. So, um, you know, I, I think Sorokin knows he's in a good spot. Uh, Varlamov's got two more years left on his deal. He's certainly been, you know, coming in his first two years, one of the most successful veteran goalies to ever join this organization. You know, even going back to the Billy Smith, Chico Rush days, this guy, two years, two, two runs to the conference final, um, you know, probably should have been a Vezina finalist this past year for what he did. Um, so I think, you know, that they're, they're really comfortable with where they are right now. And I understand there's always going to be Islander fans from these last couple of years that feel like, well, what if Robin Leonard had been able to sign a deal and stay here? And yeah, but uh, but it's been such a position of strength after being such a such a black hole for so many years. All the guys that they cycled through, and now when you think about the way that Mitch Corn and Piero Greco helped turn Leonard's career around, um, Varlamov came in, you know, as kind of the guy who'd been kicked to the curb a little bit in Colorado, and how he's turned his career around, and now. Uh, Sorokin comes over after all his success in the KHL uh, into one of the strangest situations a, a guy could ever arrive into with the pandemic and 
being on his own and not really able being able to even really interact that much with with his surroundings and uh, and he put up a pretty good year too so uh you know i think the situation is is, is very strong in net and that's the, probably the most important position for them Speaking of a young player possibly looking for a spot, could this be a year where Noah Dobson possibly overtakes Scott Mayfield for that number two right spot? Yeah, I think you'll see him play more minutes. You know, it, it, it's really about, I think Barry Trotz always likes to put it, everybody needs a role. And, uh, you know, I think the, the most important role that Dobson's going to fill is on the power play with, uh, with Nick Letty gone. I think uh, you're going to see him manning that, power, that top power play unit, if you can even say there's a top power play unit because the power play – I sort of split time pretty evenly between the units and also been very mediocre the last couple of years. So um, if Dobson can find a little niche uh, to, to make his own, I think it would be on the power play. Um, you know, his five on five play was pretty good last year. I think he, he took a little bit of a step back like guys do in the playoffs, you know, guys, his age, he, he definitely struggled a little bit as the playoffs went on, but that's part of the growing pains. And I do think you'll see him play a little bit more. And I think his, his, his chemistry with Andy green, uh, is probably a big factor in, in how much he can play five on five and keeping that as a pair together and, and whether whoever they find to play with Scott Mayfield, um, you know, should make it uh, more of an equitable distribution between the second and third pair. You know, there's a, the number one pair is very clear and those guys are going to get the bulk of the heavy minutes. But uh, but I think Dobson has a lot of leeway to, to kind of fill an important role. Going to another uh, young Islander. Uh, do you think they're going to give Oliver Wallstrom some more responsibility this year? You'd think so. You know, he certainly showed that he 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 could handle it last season when he finally got his chance, and then uh, you know they went through a stretch where he was really the guy that was driving their offense a lot of the time. You know, they had he, he's got that shot. Uh, you know, on the power play, he makes a lot of things happen. They really don't have a guy who just is a you know has a, a no conscious conscious feel about shooting the puck and uh you know to have him do it and also i think his his play away from the puck was really underrated last season you know positionally he didn't he didn't panic a lot um he used his body well um you know he was able to fill a role where they you know especially before he got hurt in the penguin series where where barry trotz felt comfortable putting him out there with with, with pajo against Sidney crosby's line or against Evgeny malkin's line and he did just fine so um, you know, I think the, the sky's the limit really for him. If he can get an opportunity, like I said, they do have a really crowded field of forwards and he's probably, he might be the only one who has options to go down without, uh, needing waivers. So, you know, you may see at the, at the beginning of camp or somewhere through camp in terms of, you know, trying to get numbers to the right, uh, to the right spot before the season starts, if he ends up being sent down, but. I can't imagine it's going to be for very long because he's an important part of what they need to do, especially offensively. Now, Arthur, b before we let you go to, to appease my Ranger fans uh, above us, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they've, um, they've obviously forever been linked to Jack Eichel and that, that situation has been a mess, but um, wh where do you see the Rangers this season? Do you think, you know, Eichel's still a viable option for him and just overall your outlook on, uh, on them going into the season? You know, I think a lot rides on, on their goaltending as usual on their defense. Um, they obviously have a ton of skill up front. And, uh, you know, when they play fast, you know, I obviously see them mostly when they play the Islanders. But when they get going, uh, you know, north-south and, and with their speed and their ability to move the puck around, uh, they can give a lot of teams problems, especially the Islanders, because the Islanders would tend to want to make it a, a much slower type game. Um, so if they're able to do that in a, on a consistent basis against the teams in their division and, and uh, you know, they certainly looked good against some of the teams in the division last year, but uh, you have to look good against all of them. And really, you know, I, I think a lot was maybe overblown a bit about how much they bulked up in terms of their bottom six and, and how they felt about being pushed around by the Islanders and those big games that eliminated them. And obviously the, the Tom Wilson situation. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that that spending a draft pick to get Ryan Reeves uh, is the way to go, but I think a guy like Barkley Goodrow is going to help them a ton. Um, you just get guys in there, you know, and I, and I think you saw it with the Islanders. You get guys in there like the Islanders did when Trotz and, uh, and Lamarillo came in. You get a guy like Valtteri Filppula who, who really helped kind of make that transition from the Islanders being a team that was starting to, you know, starting to believe what everybody was saying about them and feel sorry for themselves after a, a couple of bad seasons and realize that, you know, if you just kind of play to a smart system, uh, you know, the way that Philpola plays, uh, you can go a long way. So I think Goodrow will help them. 
you know, I think Gallant is uh, is really not a, such a technical X's and O's type coach. And, and I think the personal touch that he brings that a lot of players who have played for him before have talked about will really help some of their young guys and even some of their veteran guys. So, you know, I, I, I think a lot rides on Shesterkin and what he can do this season. Um, but I think, you know, they're going to be competitive. If, you know, there's really, to me, there's only a couple teams that, look like they're going to kind of trail the pack a little bit in that division. And you never know what's going to happen with Washington and Pittsburgh. We've been predicting their demise uh, for a long time and it never <laughs> yeah. seemed to come. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yep. It happens when you have Crosby and Ovechkin on those rosters. Yeah. So I feel like Colum- Columbus is going to struggle and Jersey is going to struggle, but anybody else, you know, uh, you know, Philly can have a big bounce back and go back to the way they were two years ago, or they could stink again and it could all fall apart. Uh, Carolina is kind of a mystery now with all the, the, you know, the, uh, spare parts they brought in in a, in a weird fashion in their goaltending situation. Yeah. Um, and the Islanders, you know, if the Islanders, the Islanders real bugaboo is depth. If they don't, if they don't really stay healthy the way that they did, especially on D and in goal, they could be in a lot of trouble this season, the way they were a couple of years ago before the pandemic shut everything down. So, um, yeah. you know, the Rangers, the Rangers to me have, have maybe the best skill of anybody in the division. And, uh, you know, if they've got the right coaching situation and obviously, this is a guy in Gallant who came in first year with a team in Vegas and took him to the finals. And he's really, you know, he's a little like Vino in that way where he comes in and he gets people to buy in right away. So I'm, I'm curious to see how they get out of the gate, how much they can believe in themselves. And maybe the Eichel situation gets resolved before camp. It feels like it would be such a mistake to, to give up a ton of assets that Buffalo is looking for to get a guy who really wants to be out of there. And I'm sure it'd be super motivated, but you still wouldn't see because of the surgery until January, February at the earliest. And, and really the season's kind of basically over by then. So, um, you know, I, I feel like they have the, they have the skill, uh, you know, Zibanejad is, is a great player. Panarin's a great player. Ryan Strom has really found a home there um, to be kind of a, a good distributor and, and partner with, uh, with Panarin. So I, I just feel like, um, you know, I, they're kind of a mystery to me, but uh, if they're great, it wouldn't surprise me. And if they're, if they're struggling again, it wouldn't surprise me, but, uh, but they seem to be on the right track. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Arthur. As always, it's a pleasure and I'll let you go. You know, you never know. Lou pulls another move and you're back to work. So I'll give you some <laughs> that's right. time here. A that's, little bit. I, I might get to go get lunch for about five seconds and that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you, you had a full month off and then suddenly, wait, what? I got to cover five signings. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm glad he waited till I was back on the clock to do all this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Jordan, well, thank you. Day, Arthur. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank guys. You, Take Arthur. care. Thank you. Thank you. You too. All right. Yeah. yeah we had Arthur Stable talking about the Rangers. How about that? <laughs> Something he probably hasn't done in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, there's still lots of stuff. Oh, well, yeah, he had, he had a lot of good, uh, he had a lot of good insights. And, you know, the main thing is you never know what lose up to, you know. They need that defenseman, you know, because Tarasenko's still out there. So we'll see what he has, what he has up his sleeve. And hell, he still didn't announce uh, Zajac and Parisa. Yeah, yeah like, Zajac shocked me. I don't know if you guys saw my face when he said Zajac. I was like, what? If you like that video, we got a lot more. So check out any of these that are right over here. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Mm, your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter.